Okay, so we are live with another uh, episode of the Open Neuroscience series, um, a track that we're doing an open source initiatives for neurosciences and life sciences in general um, for the worldwide series, series of talks. Uh, today is my immense pleasure to host Joe um, Namper with who's part of the um, Open Flexure project. So he's gonna be presenting Open Flexure, which is a project that I've been following for years and I find it really, really cool. Um, I don't wanna be, of course, talking about the project. This is what Joe do, but I would like to introduce Joe. Um, and so he's a PhD student at the University of Bath, in the lab of uh, Richard Bowman. And well, he's obviously working on the Open Flexure microscope. He is um, mainly focusing on improving the way uh, the microscope is calibrated, and also he introduced uh, reflection and fluorescence imaging to the last iteration of the microscope. Um, and now he's implementing a truly smart focal stacking uh, algorithm that they can detect correct uh, errors in Z positioning. Um, and then this is basically replacing an open loop process with a self-correcting one that makes it possible to leave the open flexural microscope running for hours and attended uh, with the confidence that the results will be good um, and at least, or that at least the microscope will know uh, when they are not. Um, and so I would, I'm like, I think this is super cool and I think it needs no more introduction. Joe, please, uh, the floor is yours. Take it away. Great, thanks Andre. You're welcome. I'm hoping now you can see my presentation. So again, thanks Andre, thanks everyone for being here and thanks to Open Neuroscience for inviting me to talk today. As Andre said, I'm Joe and I'm a PhD student at the University of Bath working on the open flexure microscope. And for the next half an hour or so, I'll be doing probably one of my favorite things which is telling you all about the open flexure project. Uh, this is going to include the history, the origins of the project, the current performance and projects that we're working on, and some future projects and features that we're looking forward to. Now, 30 odd minutes is going to be a long time for me to talk nonstop, and also quite a long time if any of you need to try and remember a question after I don't make sense on slide two. So if you do have any questions or comments or want me to go back over anything, please put something in the chat. And whenever I want to get a drink, I'll ask Andre to read some of them out as we go. We'll start with the history of the open flexure microscope or OFM. And to explain the context and reasons behind it, we need to start with what is a fairly basic question, which is traditionally speaking, what is a microscope and what are the components of it? So here you can see a fairly typical example of a commercial microscope. It, they're normally expensive on the order of tens of thousands of pounds. They're heavy and large, which respect, restricts how portable they are. If there's a problem, if they need any maintenance, then the repairs will require a engineer and normally cost a lot of money. And also they can be a bit of a black box. So people can use them and get results out, but possibly not understand what's going on at every stage underneath the hood, so to speak. It might be reasonable to assume that the majority of this size and weight comes from the optics in the microscope. But when you break one down, you can see that a large part of it is actually the structure of the microscope and the movement about 99% of the size and weight comes from the mechanics and structure. So having a sample around here that you move in X, Y, and Z, and the structure to hold all of the components in place reliably. Optics is a large part of the cost, but pretty much negligible when it comes to the weight, the size, and the level of engineering required to build a microscope which raises the question and around five years ago for Richard Bowman raised the question, can the positioning be done cheaper, smaller and lighter? The positioning in a microscope is normally done using something quite similar to this, a dovetail join, which has a smooth finish and can slide along the direction you want to move. 
But when you're looking at manufacturing things that are cheaper, smaller and lighter, the recent boom in 3D printing is pretty much unparalleled. The finish on 3D printed parts, though, is rough and layered, which makes them unsuitable for a design like this, where the surface finish needs to be as smooth as possible. However, the flexibility of plastic means that flexure hinges can be used instead, where you apply a force to bend a solid piece of plastic, both smoothly and reliably. And so around five years ago, Richard printed the first open flexure microscope based on this sort of flexure design. This microscope could hold a lens in place with a sample underneath and use the flexure hinges to allow the user to focus on the sample by adjusting the height of the lens relative to the sample. Over the next few years, the microscope gained a lot of components and extra degrees of freedom and eventually became the open flexure microscope that we use today. The designs, the instructions, and all of the documentation that we use are completely open source, which means that anyone can freely access, use, modify, and share them. Once you download the files, they'll print in around 20 hours, and all of the non-printed parts are commonly available and fairly cheap. We produce instructions for building the various types of the microscope, and we're working on producing some improved technical instructions for researchers that want a full understanding of the engineering and also some more friendly Lego style instructions for children and hobbyists that are building perhaps their first engineering project. After the printing's done and about two hours of assembly, you'll have a open flexure microscope. The open flexure microscope will be about two orders of magnitude cheaper than a commercial microscope, as well as being significantly smaller and lighter. This means that it's more portable and can be controlled remotely and left for a long time, which is ideal, for example, if you want to leave something running in a fume cupboard or somewhere else inaccessible, or for example, you're in the middle of a global pandemic and you can't get into your lab, being able to remotely control the microscopes then becomes fairly important. The cost of parts for a um, version is around 200 US dollars. This includes the illumination, the standard RMS objective to provide the magnification, a precision translation stage that can move the sample in X, Y, and Z, a Raspberry Pi and Pi camera, which can automate the image acquisition and save them and modify them to be viewed later, and a custom motor controller board that turns motors, that turn the gears that move the stage. The Pi camera also means that there's no need, like in a lot of low cost microscopes, to leave your mobile phone in place, which as well as meaning that you can leave experiments running longer and keeping the cost down, also means that you're not reliant on a certain version of a, a mobile phone being available for years to come, and also means that you don't need to put your mobile phone in a fume cupboard. To control it, the options range from using a Nintendo style video game controller plugged directly in to plugging in a screen, a mouse and a keyboard, or for more reliable and more uh, automated control, you can use Python or MATLAB scripts, which you can write yourself to perform any number of combinations of movements and captures or connect over Wi-Fi to your computer and then use the software that we also offer for free as part of the Open Flexure project. This is the software as it is at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, I think that YouTube might butcher the quality a bit, but you can connect to any of the microscopes that you have available, which will load a preview of the uh, field of view that you have on the microscope at the moment. You can then use the navigation pane to move around, either by programming in a number of steps or by clicking to focus, you can use our autofocus methods, which will trial a series of heights and then return to the sharpest area. If you're not happy with how sharp it is, you can then use some fine control to get an image that you're happy with. Once the user's happy with the image, they can go across to the capture pane where there's a number of settings, including the file name, whether they want a full resolution image, any metadata they want including, and also set an automatic scan running that can travel through a grid of X, Y, and Z with a number of different autofocus options to let the microscope run automatically while a technician works on other things. Once you take a capture, 
the image will be available immediately in the gallery for you to view and you can automatically download them across to your computer. The settings include things like changing the appearance and the accessibility or changing camera settings like the exposure time, the image quality. You also have a calibration procedure, which means that you can move directly in pixels or in physical distances rather than relying on motor steps. The software that we include in covers the majority of cases, but not everything. As I've said, you can also write scripts that can control the microscope in Python or MATLAB. And we share instructions on how you can include those in your software. If you then share them with us and with the community, these scripts can then get included in a future software release or adapted to support someone else's work in a way that you might not have seen coming. At this point, Andre, have we got any questions before I go on to some specific examples? Sorry. So, yeah, so we don't have any specific questions from the audience. I mean, if people want to type something in right now, that's also fine. But I have a question myself. Um, so there are a lot of software out there that are open source software for controlling microscopes, right? Like you have the micro manager suit, you have Fiji. Like why, why did you guys decide to go on your own independent route, so to say, instead of like kind of piggy bank? piggybacking on these already existing projects? I think there's a certain amount of liking the fact that we can rely on our own software, our own hardware, keeping things in-house where we're confident that we can provide a good solution. This also builds on what we're hoping to build towards, which is a more open internet of things where you only need one piece of software that can control say the microscope a centrifuge the lights in your lab any combination mm -hmm. of things right. and if that software is open source then i feel fairly strongly that everyone involved benefits and if it's produced by open flexure or we're involved then as far as we're concerned that's just a benefit right okay cool thank you any other questions? Uh, not so far, no. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So some of the examples of where we use this in research and the different imaging modes we do include transmission bright field imaging, where here you can see a red blood cell sample. In reflection bright field mode, we have managed to resolve here what we think is a single layer of graphene. In polarization contrast transmission, you can find a lot of details which would be saturated out using conventional bright field transmission. And as I think would be of interest to some of the people that spoke and viewed your talks last week, we also have at the moment three channel fluorescence imaging enabled on a version of the microscope. We will come back to the types of slides in the top left here, these blood slides, but as well as the benefits of having a high image quality and the automation at a low cost, the open flexion microscopes benefits in research and experiments extend far beyond any specific case, which is part of the benefit of it being open source. One major advantage is the fact that you can digitize slides, which means that they can be stored and viewed later. They can be edited, drawn on, if you are training new technicians, then you can draw arrows on the slide rather than relying on them looking down an eyepiece at the same field of view as you are. It can be manufactured, maintained, and used at a low cost around the world. This doesn't just mean at labs around the world. On the left, you can see one of our collaborators, Joram, at a lab in Tanzania, but they've also been used for about the most remote field work you can imagine, including out in the Antarctic, and doing field work using a SNES controller in the Peruvian rainforest. And of course, the fact that it's open and adaptable means that not only can people build on our work, modify it, share it, and bring the project along, people can also use individual components, such as the translation stage, as a component in their own experiments and their own larger work, something that we saw an example of at a conference earlier this week 
where people are using the translation stage as one small part of their microscopy setup. All of these advantages apply to a lot of different types of research, but the main advantage that we're working towards and the main project that we're hoping to build on is supporting the diagnosis of malaria in low resource areas. The World Health Organization for the last 20 years at least has described manual optical microscopy as the gold standard for malaria diagnosis. The access to this is limited by the need for expensive microscopes, trained technicians, maintenance and international supply chains, which can be severely limited in the areas around the world that malaria is still endemic. Locally manufacturing instead of low cost portable and digital microscope can remove many of these issues, which is why we're developing the open flexion microscope from being an academic prototype to be shared and built on towards being a certified medical device for point of care diagnosis. Using a hundred times high NA RMS objective, a standard objective to use for something like this, we can resolve the area inside the red circle. This is Plasmodium falciparum. It's the malaria parasite responsible for nearly all of the malarial deaths worldwide, which is almost half a million per year. And over 60% of these deaths are children under the age of five. If diagnosed early, the prognosis for malaria is generally quite positive. But if undiagnosed or diagnosed wrongly, the consequences can be severe. Not just the medical consequences of someone receiving treatment for the wrong condition, but also the economic ramifications of spending resources on the wrong medicine to treat the wrong condition, and also social aspects of lowering the confidence that people have in the area in healthcare professionals. To see how much we can support this, we have microscopes that are being manufactured here at Bongo Tech in Dar es Salaam. They're then used in multiple health cl uh, clinics and institutes across Tanzania to image blood samples. Here, we're not just testing the optical performance of the microscope, whether or not we can resolve the parasites with enough contrast, but also the software we include. Is it understandable enough? Is it accessible enough? Testing the speed to make sure that we're not unnecessarily delaying results or causing it so that people can't receive the diagnosis at the point of care in real time. The level of focusing that we can achieve to make sure that the diagnostician has access to as much information as possible. The mechanics being suitable, not just for an air conditioned lab in Bath, but suitable for very different conditions out in Tanzania and around the world. Testing the lifetime to make sure that the microscope isn't going to fail so quickly that printing, replacing and repairing them becomes more trouble than they're worth. The parameters that we use, making sure that we're looking over a large enough area. And finally, the reliability of all of these things, just because the focusing and the mechanics and the lifetime are suitable at the moment. Will they continue to be suitable after a small change? Will they continue to be suitable, suitable after six months? Getting medical certification requires a full understanding of every aspect of what can go wrong, how and when. An example of something that these trials showed us that we need to, needed to improve on so that we could support healthcare professionals in these areas is the autofocus. As you saw in the software. So, the yep. Sorry to interrupt you, but no before problem. you go on to this topic, um, there was a question, there is a question from the audience. Okay. Which is, Carlos is asking, what about an upright version for brain slice applications? We are working on a upright version. Mm -hmm. uh, again, all of the designs for that are available online. Mm -hmm. um, completely freely available. That's one that we're using uh, especially to demonstrate certain things like in undergraduate labs. Um, and I'd be more than happy to share the link to the upright version. And it's one that people have requested in the past and I'm pleased that we're making progress on. Okay, great. I think this is this would be quite interesting for people. Is this on the openflexure.org page or is it uh, this on will be GitLab on our, directly? This will be on our GitLab, yeah. Okay, yeah. 
So I can find the GitLab and share that. But then later after the talk, if you want to share the link, we can share on the chat as well. Yep. Um, I have a question which is related to the last bit that you were talking about, the medical certification and everything. Okay. Which is more on the on the person level, I would say. Like oftentimes when we present people like these open source devices that are 3D printed, they're plastic and not metal and so on. There is a lot of kind of at least like an initial resistance, right? Yeah. So like, but this is like a block of printed whatever, right? Like I'm not gonna use this for my experiments, stuff like that. Oh, sure. What what has been your experience uh, with these types of things so far? I think there's definitely a reasonable amount of cynicism towards things like this. I'll hold my hands up and say that at times we probably don't help ourselves by printing the equipment in any of the bright and wonderful colors we can get our hands on. <laughs> Perhaps if we printed them in gray and matte black, uh, people would tend to trust it more. I see. Uh, but also it becomes so important to focus on collaboration and building a community around the microscope rather than uh, what some people refer to as the white messiah complex, going over to areas that you don't understand and saying that you've got a solution for them. Mm -hmm. We're suggesting and working with people in Tanzania to build a solution that people can have confidence in. And we'd also never want to suggest that we're trying to replace the expertise of local healthcare professionals. We're right. hoping to offer them a tool to improve their workflow and support their work. Okay. But that is a, an ongoing challenge and one that there probably is no right answer to, but yeah. one that as much open collaboration, as much honesty as possible will hopefully help people have the same level of faith in the microscope that we have. Cool. Yeah, I like that idea of uh, trust by transparency, right? Right. Cool. Okay. I think these are all the questions for now. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So one example where we have had to hold our hands up and admit that our solution wasn't ready for blood samples was in autofocusing. As you saw, the standard autofocus takes around four seconds and is accurate to within about three microns of the focal plane. An autofocus on a digital microscope works, as you can see here, by moving the optics closer to the sample and tracking the sharpness and then returning to the position where the sharpness was highest. These steps are sufficient for pretty much all cases, especially at lower magnification. But when attempting to diagnose malaria, you need the highest level of precision possible. As I said, the autofocus will reliably get to within around three microns. But to give an idea of scale, here are some blood images taken on the microscope using 100 times objective at the focal plane and then one, two, three, five and 10 microns away from the focal plane. So clearly we're aiming to be within this one micron of the focal plane and at this level of defocus, we'd be taking information away from the diagnostician. So to account for this, we added some extra steps to the autofocus software when working on blood samples, adding a version of closed loop scanning, which will measure the sharpness of images as they're taken and we'll only accept that an image is sufficiently sharp when the images around it indicate that the system has focused. And if it doesn't get to a point that it's happy it's focused, it will abort and automatically restart that stack. So for example, here you can see that the first image in the stack is slightly out of focus. Going through nine more images, the center image was more focused than the others, and then the system begins to defocus again. This is what we'd expect to see around the focal plane. And if we don't see that, we know that there's been a problem with the sample or with the focusing, and we can restart or inform a technician. If, however, the sample does look like this with a nice stack uh, focused on the sharpest point, then we can take that sharpest image and have high confidence that we can use it as part of diagnosis and save the other images as well to assess later how well the system did focus. This brings us closer to the idea of closed loop microscopy, where, as Andre alluded to, the system can automatically detect and correct problems in real time, instead of relying on a technician to identify them later, and then trying to go over a large area, collecting individual images that we might have missed. 
Instead, we hope that people can have a high level of confidence tiling focused images together and the diagnostician could leave a sample being imaged and the images being stored automatically on their microscope, which lets them spend their time instead on the skilled aspects of their job, including searching a large scale image like this for individual parasites. Long term, we're hoping to add in machine learning as well to let the microscope tell the technician where they should be looking or to make recommendations such as uh, the software believes that this sample is positive for malaria, negative for malaria, or there's an issue with the slide and it needs redoing or should be manually examined. I think it's important as well when building trust to admit that your system will and should have times where the best solution is to redo it or to ask a technician to manually examine. The work towards malaria diagnosis and making the open flexure microscope truly open and truly global is part of the reason that one of our taglines is about robotic microscopy or the open flexure microscope for everyone. The number of use cases isn't just limited to academic research or healthcare, also science outreach, teaching in schools and in undergraduate labs, working literally out in the field where conventional microscopes either can't go or the owners would be quite unwilling to let you take them there. And also for having fun. Hobbyists can build a version of the microscope for less than 20 US dollars, all the way up to the 200 US dollar version that I mentioned before. And it is a great tool that people now with the increased accessibility of 3D printing and having parts delivered, it means that there's hopefully one fewer barrier to getting involved and interested in microscopy. But crucially, we can't predict every use case. I'm sure that Richard five years ago probably didn't predict that we could be uh, building them, presenting them at outreach events. Uh, Richard himself here uh, using one and Julian out in the middle of a rainforest in Peru um, using a video game controller of all things to control the microscope in the field. We can't predict where these cases are gonna go next uh, and we're not trying to. Instead, we're focusing on building a community that's focused on supporting and sharing the designs and the use of the microscope. And this is a community that we lead and we'll try to push and advertise and promote as much as possible but we don't determine the direction of it. And it's important to point out as well, we're not tech support. We'll hopefully be able to help with uh, questions that people get in touch with, or remember that someone else had a similar issue or a similar project some other time. But at this point, it is about growing the community. Some of the steps towards that is getting the microscope suitable for education. We think it's a great tool for more formal education. Here you can see microscopes being printed and stored at the University of Nairobi, where they were going to be used locally for education. We're working with university labs to give undergraduates more hands-on experience in microscopy. Uh, for example, giving them the chance to work hands-on with fluorescence imaging. Fluorescence microscopes, typically very expensive, and a undergraduate wouldn't get the chance to use one. In using the open flexion microscope, not only would they have the chance to use one, they'd have the chance to build one. They'd see physically each component, they'd understand where they go and why, removing the criticism that education can introduce black boxes that students can see the result of without understanding what's physically going on. We're also working on workshops for school children to build, use and even automate their own microscopes. In the UK, this will hopefully take place in schools to support the understanding and enjoyment of practical science as part of the national curriculum. But the microscope can also be used for more informal education and outreach. Um, the fact that we can tell people that they can build and print their own microscope costing anywhere between 20 and 200 US dollars for a number of different things. For example, at the Global Open Source Hardware Summit in 2018, and more recently at the Royal Microscopy Society Outreach and Engagement event in the summer of 2019, 
where we went with some nanoscientists from Bath, giving people the chance to first isolate graphene and then try and find it under one of the open flexion microscopes. As well as, of course, doing talks like this and promoting the fact that the microscope isn't limited to being a single tool for single use. It's a open project that we hope people can use to inspire and impress in a number of different ways. We try and make this as easy as possible by having not just instructions for printing and assembling the microscope, but also a handbook for how to use it, troubleshooting, and suggestions of interesting projects for people that think they might be interested in having a microscope, but they're not sure what to do with it next. We have a YouTube channel where we upload videos with updates, latest releases, um, and also have playlists of other people building and using the microscope when they've got in touch with us. It also lets us upload things like lab tours. And just using YouTube search for open flexion, we find that there are more projects going on based on our work or using our microscope than we ever knew about. At the end of this talk, I would really encourage you to search out the Open Flexion Microscope YouTube channel, preferably not during the talk. We also have a forum and a chat room where people can suggest ideas, um, share troubleshooting issues or suggest solutions. Uh, we get messages saying that people have come across the microscope and want to know whether they can use it, whether we think it's suitable to use in different ways. Other requests and suggestions can take us in even more unexpected directions, like people asking fairly recently whether they could replace the uh, rubber bands that we use with hair ties or elastic from clothes, all the way through to whether or not we think that the microscope could be adapted to support a heavier optics module. And that suggestion is what led to this, the open flexure delta stage, the big brother of the open flexure microscope. The design of this is slightly different in that it holds the optics completely in place and moves the sample relative to it in X, Y, and Z. This makes it better for heavy optics modules, uh, such as doing fluorescence imaging with the extra filters required for that. But other than those changes, it operates almost identically to the microscope. Everything I've said so far about it being open source, controlled by the hardware, uh, controlled by the software with multiple hardware options, still all applies to the Delta stage. The other application we found for our uh, flexures is the open flexure block stage, which is a block stage that has submicron positioning with impressive mechanical stability, considering it's also based on the 3D printed flexure hinges that go into the microscope and delta stage. We suggest that it's got applications in fiber alignment, electrophysiology probing and graphene transfer. And it's also been automated to align two optical fibers without needing user input. And it has all of the advantages of the microscope. It's low cost, accessible, and can be customized for whatever uses people can think of for a, a very reliable and accurate block stage. Andre, are there any other questions before I look to the future? Well, not from YouTube. Um, okay. But yeah, so I actually had a question if you could share, because we talked about the communities and all of these things that are going on that are super exciting. Yep. Maybe if you can, or I saw that Richard is also on the YouTube audience. So maybe if either one of you could share the links to all of these things, because like if I look for them now, like I'm going to miss like what you're talking about and so on. And I didn't want to. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm sure that Richard will be happy to do that. But uh also, I'd first point anyone towards the uh, website, openflexure.org, okay, where we've got one the, the designs, the forums, our Git, all of the files and instructions. Uh, okay, cool. So everything is there. So, okay. So if people want to find the community, find the forums, go to openflexure.org, yep. which is already shared on uh, the YouTube chat window for those okay, of great. you who are chiming in now. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Andre. Yep. So looking towards the ongoing and future work on all three of the products, 
for a large part, it's about continuing the development, developing them towards education, towards research and towards healthcare. Uh, a lot of this extension comes in adding options to the uh, different products. This can be technical options, such as adding other imaging modes, or as I mentioned before, automating diagnosis to make recommendations to a healthcare professional. But it can also be adding social options like the Lego style accessible instructions for children wanting to build a microscope or translating our instructions and documentations into other languages. And a large part as well isn't us firsthand extending the project by updating the code and the designs, but instead seeing what other people have come up with and shared and making sure that people are signposted to them. And if anyone improves or modifies any of our designs, making sure that we share it as, well, as far and wide as possible. As I mentioned before, we also want to certify the open flexure microscope as a medical device. We want it to be the, I'm missing the word, first on this slide here, sorry, the first in vitro diagnostic medical device manufactured in Tanzania. This requires, rather than adding a series of new options and features, engineering the features we have and that we need for diagnosis for robustness. We need to make sure that every single failure mode is understood and mitigated as much as possible which is part of completing the FMA, a failure mode analysis, uh, just one row of which is shown at the bottom of the slide here. A failure mode analysis is a document that should be completed and then maintained throughout the project's entire life of what can go wrong and how and why can it go wrong? How long before it's acceptable for this failure to happen? And how do we extend the lifetime of the product as long as possible before this failure happens, while also minimizing the impact on the users. And here you can see one example of this, where before we would screw sample holders directly into the stage, but we found that this can strip the threads inside, which prevents the sample from being held properly. So instead we updated to this design where you can use nuts to screw into holding the sample in place more reliably. This might seem like a fairly minor issue, but the FMA flagged it. It's very easily done, and the impact is that you'd need to completely reprint the uh, microscope body. And it's that combination of easily done with a severe impact that an FMA should be alerting the users to, to make sure that we can fix it as early as possible. And also that these fixes are understood not just by us or by the users, but by every step in the chain of the product that we're hoping people can use. It might not be a surprise after all of the projects and all of the things that I've said that the Open Flexure team involves a lot of people at the University of Bath in the Open Instrumentation Group. That's Julian, Ed, Casper, myself and Richard. Our engineering partners in Tanzania, Bongo Tech, includes Valerian, Paul and Grace. The Ifakara Health Institute, also in Tanzania, includes Catherine, Valeriana and Joram. And at the University of Cambridge, we work with Samuel, Boyko, Philip and Pietro. It's probably not surprising based on the number of names here and also the recent pandemic that we've never managed to get us all together in the same room, never mind the same country for a group photo. But fortunately, Julian's edited this one together of what it would look like if we all met up. But this formal listing of the teams only tells part of the story. The Open Flexure community is continuing to grow. On this map, you can see all of the countries so far that we know people have built or used the microscope. So if you're listening to this talk, especially from Russia or Canada or Brazil or Australia, please print out and build a microscope take a picture of yourself using it next to some huge national monument. That'd be great. We'd love to hear from you. And the number of places and number of applications that we keep hearing about continue to grow, which is great to hear. As a final recap, then, we started five years ago with this small flexure-based microscope that can focus on a sample. That project developed and developed 
until it turned into three separate products, all based not just on the same physical hardware of 3D printed hinges, but also on the same ethos of sharing our designs openly and letting the community direct our project. We're showing the software that people can use and adapt to control their microscope, set experiments running with a high level of confidence that they can leave a microscope running potentially for hours and come back to a sample and an image that they can use. I've shared a bit about the community that seems to be growing all the time with the suggestions, the support, and the weird and wonderful requests that we get from time to time. If anything I've said today sounds interested or interesting, or if you'd like to know how the OpenFlexure projects can support your research or anything you're working towards or anything you're interested in, as I've said before, please do head to openflexure.org and get in touch with us. It's always great to hear from new people. Again, I'd like to thank Andre and Open Neuroscience. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and I do look forward to any questions. Thank you. Joe, thank you. This was very, very pleasant and very nice. Um, it's really wonderful. Um, I'm really, yeah, uh, as I said from the beginning, right? I'm a big fan of the project and now Peter. getting more, more the details, uh, it's, it's wonderful. I have a couple of questions. So the first question that I have is you mentioned something about the weight and the optics, right? And yep. why you build the Delta stage. Like what is the maximum weight you could put on your traditional system where you move the optics? And the reason why I'm asking this is like, how can we, like we work a lot with two photo microscopes in the labs in, in the department here in Sussex. And these have like a big X, Y, Z movement stage because you move like a lot of optics, right? Yep. It's quite heavy and we can definitely like improve the, the design so that it's lighter. But what would be like the maximum weight if this is already tested, like that I could put on each of these different products that you guys have or different models that you have? Uh, top part. Of that, I wouldn't want to put a number on it. Right. Uh, as I say, the fact that we went from, uh, if people can see this, this is one of the microscopes to give an idea of size, obviously mm -hmm. without all of the components included. For that to a delta stage that holds the optics in place so that we can add as many filters and lenses as people are interested in mm -hmm. uh, and hold that in place while moving the sample um, does give people the option to hopefully do uh, different kinds of imaging and use different types of sample. I wouldn't want to put a number on it, but we have worked in the past on building something that can test the performance not just of the finished microscope but also mm -hmm. test the plastics we're using in them to make sure we understand every step right okay cool um another question that i have is about the medical certification and you show this document where you show like every failure mode and so on yep and this is something that is normally not open source right because i guess like the medical certification is expensive and it takes time and therefore people don't share this but one thing is just one thought, right? Like it would be really wonderful for repairability if all the companies that do produce like medical devices would share this, right? Because then if your microscope, yeah, anyways. And then are you like, is this something that you guys are also making open source? Did I miss that or did you not say or? As far as I know, this is also uh, freely shared. If not, I imagine that Richard is probably correcting me in the chat right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as I say, the certification that we're hoping to get isn't for our designs, our documentation, our instructions. It is for a finished physical product. Mm -hmm. And the way that liability works is that every step in the chain, all the way from the design through to the users, need to understand this failure. And as you say, we definitely think that people should be aware of all of these failures if they're interested in the microscope before they print it out rather than after they've committed to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, so Richard, so because there is a lag in between our transmission and what is going on on YouTube or our chat here in Zoom and what's going on in YouTube, Richard just added um, that on the regular microscope, he wouldn't want to increase the load much beyond an objective. So for us, it's not just the weight, but also torsion from cables and so on that, yeah. that does, does the thing in. Sorry, were you asking about the optics module or the sample? Um, well, I mean, both of them. I, like, what I'm interested in is, I think my, my thought is, can we 
basically on one of our two photos start thinking about or playing with the idea of actually actually substituting the x x y z stage that we have for an open flexure one right and i wanted to get more or less an idea of like how much weight can it load okay either either the delta stage or the or the tradition like the original one let's let's call it like that um so that I, we can also start thinking about how can we reduce the weight of the two photon one. Um, and then Richard also adds, there is some data on load capacity versus stiffness on the, uh, in the block stage paper. Okay, I'll take a look at that. And I suggest everyone to take a look as well. Um, and he's also saying that one of the aims is to make much of the medical work uh, as open as possible for as long as you, you guys can fund it. So. Yeah, maybe it's time to set up a, a um, what is it called? An open collective for open flexure, if you don't have one already, right? Since, I don't know, yeah, maybe it's a good idea. Um, well, as you can tell from this talk, we are short of places to share what we're doing and- <laughs> yeah, Exactly, right, we need one more place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, I mean, there are no more questions from the audience. Um, I would like to thank you again for this amazing talk. Um, if you have no further comments, I think we can call this a very another very successful uh, presentation. Uh, thanks again. Thanks to Richard and all the Open Flexure team. This was really good. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, everyone.